Good afternoon. Isn't this a beautiful room? This is just lovely, isn't it? Um, I'm Mark Toule. I'm the MC for today. Um, I'll also be moderating the Q&A. &A. I'm the senior director here at CCP. Can, can I get a show of hands? This is the sixth CEO investor forum. If you've been here six or five times, can you raise your hand? Oh, that's a lot. Okay. Um, if you've been here to three or four, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, if it's your first one, raise your hand. Oh, it's a good mix. This is good. And if you're never going to come back again because of the MC, please raise your hand. <laughs> this is going to be like the Oscar. Daryl told me if I didn't get it right, that was it. It was my last chance, so I better make, I make, better make it work. It's going to be a great day. We have the CEO of Nestle, Mark Schneider, CEO of JetBlue, Robin Hayes, CEO of Equinox, Peter Van Camp, CEO of Amerisource Bergen, uh, Steve Collins, and then we've got the Honorable uh, Leo Strine, who's going to be interviewed. So we've got a packed day. We're even going to give you a break, 20 minutes, if we keep on track here. And one thing that we do here all the time, we start on time, we end on time. So the presentations will be 35 minutes, five minutes for Q&A. And then I want to direct your attention to this blue form, which is very important. It's important because the feedback you provide is going to be shared with the CEOs. So rather than wait to the end to fill this out, if everyone can take out the blue form and um, just get it ready so after the presentation you can fill that out. Uh, it also doubles as your ticket to the reception. So that's another, another good reason for this. Um, we're going to have a couple polls. Uh, Wall Street webcasting is simulcasting this live as part of Reg FD so that there are thousands of individuals and uh, investors that eclipse over 25 trillion that are going to be watching this at the same time as you are. So we'll be taking your questions and we'll be taking questions from Wall Street webcasting. And with that, um, so that they invite me back another year here, I'm going to stop talking and invite uh, someone who's really been special and important to this initiative, Michelle Edkins, who is the Managing Director, Global Head of BlackRock Investment Stewardship. BlackRock has been, uh, on day one, has been supporting our work and has been on our advisory boards. So with that, please welcome Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce Mark Schneider, CEO of Nestle. Uh, as many of you may know, Mark joined Nestle in September 2016 from Fresenius, which is a global healthcare company, uh, where he served as CEO from 2003 to 2016, having joined as CFO of Fresenius Medical Care in 2001. The media commenting on Mark's appointment as CEO at Nestle expressed surprise, given he was the first outside appointee to that role in nearly a century at Nestle. Importantly for this audience, coverage also noted his long-term track record and the fact that he oversaw, in quotes, exciting and sustainable growth at his former company. Analysts read a lot into his background in healthcare as opposed to consumer goods as a sign of a transformation at Nestle towards health. Nonetheless, Mark co-chairs the board of directors of Serial Partners Worldwide, is a member of the board of the Consumer Goods Forum, and is on the advisory board of the Swiss Innovation Park. And he apparently is fully committed personally to Nestle's nutrition, health, and wellness strategy in as much as he enjoys preparing smoothies for his families on Saturday mornings. In a video clip for Nestle's Global Youth Initiative, Mark advocated for finding a calling and sticking with it with vigor. And it seems reasonable to read into that comment that for Mark, that is a focus on delivering long-term shareholder value. As I was preparing for uh, this introduction, I looked at some of the uh, transcripts of the investment bank presentations he's done since joining uh, Nestle as CEO, and throughout you see an emphasis on purpose, shared value, having a long-term mindset, innovation, and investing capital in productive ways for long-term value. 
And so on that note, we look forward to hearing more, and it pleases me enormously, and I ask you to join me in welcoming Nestle CEO, Mark Schneider. Well, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, warm welcome, and uh, my thanks to the organizers of uh, CECP for this uh, invitation. On behalf of the more than uh, 300,000 uh, Nestle associates around the world, it's a particular pleasure to be here today and to, to present to you about our long-term vision, our long-term agenda, and also the sustainability and social agenda that our company has been working on for a long period of time. Let me say right up front, this is a difficult slot right after delicious lunch. As you know, I've been working in healthcare before, so I know exactly what's going on inside each and every one of you right now. <laughs> In speaker circles, they call this Death Valley. Um, I'll try to make it as interesting as possible, but uh, if I see you nodding off, um, I totally understand. Now, um, I won't spend too much time on the safe harbor statement, but take it as uh, read. And the outline of the presentation is that I will give you an overview of our purpose and our business to get us started. I'll talk about the long-term value creation model of our company, then I'll give you four specific examples in the creating shared value section, uh, priorities that we pursue at the present time, and I'll finish off with some of the uh, financial results that we've been delivering for the long term. Now, before I even get into the specifics of our purpose, let me just say very simply, purpose is back in fashion. I'm sure you all noticed. And a good example was this year's BlackRock CEO letter. Uh, where this whole notion of purpose was stressed very much. And the old 1980s mantra of, we're here to make money, is simply no longer good enough. People want to know how you're making money, why? And what is the societal purpose that you're serving in doing that? And what are some of the long-term consequences of what you're doing? And I think against this backdrop, um, uh, you need to judge the long-term strategy of a company and you need to judge uh, the long-term agenda. A good purpose can unite, a good purpose endures, and uh, this is not in contradiction to long-term financial success. Now, to understand our purpose, it's important to understand how the company got founded 150 years ago. So Henri Nestler was a pharmacist in the Swiss town of Bibi, and what he invented in the 1860s is the precursor to what you would know as infant formula today. So farine lacté was a mixture of condensed milk and ground up cereal, and uh, it helped save uh, the life of a child in the immediate neighborhood, and it went on to make significant contributions when it comes to reducing child mortality. So when we talk about enhancing quality of life and contributing to a healthier future, this is something that's very, very closely connected to what the company got founded on. And this is something that to this day we pursue with very strong vigor. Now, in terms of the business, uh, total Revenues around $90 billion. You see here our geographic profile. Our zone Americas, North and South America, almost half of the company. The United States is the largest individual country market. Uh, we have 70 plants in this country, employ about 50,000 people, and we have a result, we have a sales number of about 30 billion in the United States. Uh, you see pretty strong presence, of course, in our European home market and then also a strongly growing business, in particular in uh, Asia and Africa. In terms of the uh, businesses we're involved in, the largest one is beverages, which is our term for coffee largely. Uh, coffee, we are the inventor of soluble coffee. We are also the inventor of uh, uh, capsule coffee. Our Nespresso system, I think, is known around the world for being the quality leader in that space. And that by, by now has grown into our most significant uh, product category. And the next one is what the business got founded on, and that's our nutrition business. Uh, these days, it is no longer just infant nutrition. It's also medical nutrition uh, that serves the aging population. Milk products, dairy products, are very closely connected, again, to our company's roots. Uh, pet care is a business we have built up over the past 20, 30 years, uh, very patiently to be one of the world market leaders now. Uh, prepared dishes and cooking aids, uh, also a category that serves very much the convenience aspect, and confectionery and water uh, round off uh, that product spectrum. As you look at the bottom, um, as I said, more than 300,000 associates around the world. I also listed our total payroll, about 16 billion. 
And I also listed, a little unusual, the taxes we pay around the world, close to four billion. And let me say in that context that even before some of the latest OECD transparency drives, this whole notion of paying our taxes and, and, and doing our duty to society is very near and dear to us. Taxes, as Winston Churchill said, are the price that we pay for a civilized society. So we never bragged about how little taxes we pay. And uh, I think we always, in, while we were trying to be efficient about taxes, we always try to do this within reason. Moving on to our strategy, um, clearly with some of the latest portfolio moves, our focus on food and beverage has become clearer than ever before. Within food and beverage, it's important to me, in addition to the health component and to something that's delicious, that we point out this whole notion of convenience. In a time-starved world, that is important. Ideally, if you grew all your food in your backyard, and if you prepared everything from the ground up, uh, you wouldn't have much need for Nestle products. But that is not the life we need. Uh, the, life, the life we need is basically one where we want healthy and nutritious food and delicious food, but at the same time, we have limited time in preparing it. And this is where we come in, in terms of processing it, giving it some added convenience uh, so that you can use it without investing all that time. In addition to food and beverage, uh, we pursue our nutritional health uh, products uh, strategy. So this is built around medical nutrition, uh, some vitamins, minerals, supplements that really allow people to lead a healthier life. And underpinning all of that is our commitment to creating shared value. This whole notion that when you pursue business, every stakeholder that's connected to you should benefit in the long term. Here you see our financial long-term value creation model, and it really rests on three important aspects that we try to pursue in balance. One is, from the left to right, organic growth. To us, organic growth is really important as we're in a growing uh, business of food and beverage in a rising world population. So organic growth, to us, is the lifeblood of an organization. It shows how much our products are in demand uh, with our consumers and whether we get good prices for them. Um, and it really opens up a whole lot of energy and opportunity inside every organization. The next one is efficiency, and so improving margins is important over time so that the growth results in also improving profitability. And the last one, allocating capital prudently and this whole notion of capital efficiency is important so that you really, over time, achieve competitive capital returns. When those three things are being pursued in balance, good things happen. When you pursue only one or two of these at the expense of the third one, then usually there's trouble around the corner. And note, please, at the bottom, again, um, this is all resting on this commitment towards creating shared value. We believe that in this journey, as you try to improve on all of these three pillars, increasing growth, improving margins, and allocating capital efficiently, if you do that at the expense, at the long-term expense, of any of the stakeholders you're dealing with, at some point, people will feel they get the short end of the stick, and hence, it's not a long-term strategy. So your stakeholders around you just need to be happy for this to be a truly long-term uh, model. One of the key underpinnings of long-term organic growth to us is innovation. I think this truly drives the opportunity in food and beverage. And in the interest of time, I won't go through all of these examples here, but you see on the left-hand side of the slide some of the recent trends. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see some of the specific products that we've been bringing to the market recently. Um, as we are pursuing new food and beverage options as consumers ever faster than before, it's important that we also cut our cycle times when it comes to bringing these new products to the market. So in the past, the development time for a new product would take about two to three years. Uh, now it's been down to six to nine months, and that's pretty much at par with some of the best-in-class, small to mid-size focused competitors out there. With changing consumer tastes, we also saw a need to tweak our portfolio. But please note, I didn't start on this notion. So um, it is important over time to adjust our portfolio through buying and selling. But buying and selling alone, US investors know that better than I do, cannot be a value-building strategy for a company in its own right. It can complement some of the operating things we're doing, but if only through buying and selling we would try to achieve value, 
I guess your conclusion would be that you as investors can do so in a cheaper way. So every time we sell something, there's a complex carve-out procedure. Every time we buy something, whatever we buy has to be um, integrated in a proper way so that we can fulfill our business plans. Hence, our switching costs in terms of getting out of something, getting into something, are much, much higher than yours. That's one more reason why portfolio management needs to be done with prudence. As you look at the last two years, uh, we were selling some activities, for example, our US confectionery business, where our market share had been less than 5%. We also sold some non-core assets, such as, for example, our Gerber life insurance business. We have two businesses under strategic review, our Nestle skin health business, and also our hair tar cold cuts and meat-based products business. And then we acquired a few businesses over the past two years, most notably the Starbucks uh, CPG global license and US business, uh, which I think is giving us a whole lot of opportunity in the coffee space and, of course, control of a third major dominant brand name in this space next to Nescafe and Nespresso. In addition to that, we also beefed up our medical nutrition area uh, with the acquisition of Atrium Innovations, which is best known for its brand, Garden of Life. Let's switch gears and talk about this whole approach of creating shared value, which is something that from the inception of the company, uh, we have very strongly believed in. The term itself was only coined about two decades ago, but I think the mindset uh, to us, that's the soundtrack to how we do business. And it's important to look at this triangle and see where it resides, um, certainly above compliance and above sustainability, because those two at the bottom, we kind of take for granted. But the creating shared value mindset, that is something that as a philosophy and as, a, as, an, as an approach to business permeates everything we do. And having joined the company about two and a half years ago, I can tell you that upon joining and when talking to the board of directors, this whole notion like what approach to business do you personally stand for? What are your values? How do you conduct your business? And how have you conducted it in the past? That was a key uh, discussion I had with all of these people who were involved in the hiring process. And that's also something that I carry forward with the senior hires that I'm responsible for. On the right-hand side, you see the three frames um, in which we uh, categorize uh, the creating shared value activities. So clearly, there's a lot of work for individuals and families, for example, around nutrition. There's a lot of work for communities. Think, for example, about the communities that we source from in an agricultural setting or where we operate um, some of our facilities. We have 413 plants that we operate around the world. And then for the planet, those are some of the sustainability goals, such as, for example, related to CO2 emissions or plastics waste. Our corporate risk group every year uh, conducts a materiality assessment. Um, so here are uh, the two uh, impact uh, axes. One is impact on Nestle's business, and the other one is the importance uh, to our stakeholders. Um, that matrix gets discussed in a great amount of detail with our executive board every year. The executive board is the senior leadership team of the company, and then we also discuss this once a year in detail with our board of directors. On the following page, I've taken now some of the key areas uh, that uh, have been identified as part of this uh, matrix, and I'll show you some of the specific uh, projects that we're working on to improve our impact uh, in those areas. So I'll be talking first about this whole notion of the nutritional profile of our products. I'll second talk about uh, responsible sourcing and supply chain stewardship. Then I'll talk about the plastics waste um, area, which has been getting a lot more attention recently over the past year. And finally, um, when it comes to some internal um, uh, projects we're focusing on, I'll talk about our drive to improve uh, gender balance inside the company. So first, on the nutritional profile, well, certainly we'll try to improve nutrition for all age group. I think in particular for children, it's important to form the right lifelong nutritional habits. So this is why we kicked off this Nestle for Healthier Kids campaign uh, last year. Uh, you see here on the left-hand side, this is uh, me during the uh, kickoff campaign, which we started in uh, Dubai in uh, April 2018. And this is an umbrella campaign that covers all of our locations worldwide. Uh, in addition to improving, of course, our products, 
This also involves working a lot with schools and other institutions to help children uh, learn the right nutritional habits, uh, provide more information, and also provide tools uh, to parents and caregivers so that they can give the right advice and learn the, and teach the right things uh, to children. You see here on the right-hand side some examples of nutritionally improved products. To me, progress in this area is one of those where we're doing good and doing well at the same time because when we did some post-mortems on nutritionally improved products, it did turn out that those show a significantly better growth and also significantly better profitability. So these days when you run a food and beverage company, it's no longer just about maximizing the amount of food products that you're selling. It is about selling the right things and selling something that is higher value and, uh, and serves a better purpose uh, for the consumers around the world. The next area, responsible sourcing, is one that also goes right back to the founding of the company. As you can imagine, from the beginning, this business had a huge need for dairy and milk products. And so we are the inventor of the modern day milk district. So working together in a collaborative fashion with milk farmers around us uh, to be sure we have a safe source of supply and that they have a safe source of demand. This is a model that we invented in Switzerland in the 1860s and it was a pretty significant success that we exported to virtually every country we do business in. And so these days, when you go to Pakistan, when you go to South America, everyone in agriculture knows what a milk district is. And so this whole notion of working with fragile agricultural communities that are exposed to the weather, to the elements, to the vagaries of nature around the world and being a reliable partner to them in good years and not so good years, I think that is something that is very close to uh, Nestle's DNA. I think in all categories, whether it's dairy, coffee, cocoa, or others, you will find farmers who for the second, third, fourth, fifth generation have been working with us um, as a trusted um, uh, customer and they really like the fact that we stick with them through thick and thin. Being a good customer also means providing technological assistance where we can. So in addition to a whole lot of central R&D, some of the basic educational work we do on the ground to help farmers improve their yields, and also in some cases provide microfinance and credit, um, I think is something that uh, makes Nestle stand out. And so where we are competing for scarce, high quality material, typically you see Nestle win now, it's simply as a result of this iconic standing we have with agricultural communities around the world. And then this is what I'm pointing to on the right hand side. So again, it's a case of doing well and doing good at the same time. Um, all of this work really translates, in my opinion, into uh, better agricultural sourcing, better quality, and in the long term also a better financial model. The third area, plastics waste, uh, that is one that has gathered a lot of pace over the past year. There's a lot of consumer concern, rightfully so, and I think there's also a lot of regulatory interest. I think this is one of those problems that has been building over time where 30, 40 years ago, plastics packaging was seen as a miraculous solution to packaging problems. It would involve much longer shelf life for products, uh, be a major contributor to food safety, and really be seen as a, as a solution for the better. And it took then a fairly long period of time for all of us collectively to understand that there are some unintended consequences when it comes to plastics waste accumulating in the oceans and around the world. So now that we are aware of this, I think it's important to work on solutions with a large degree of urgency. It's important for us not only to be at the mercy of packaging and plastics manufacturers here, so we have founded last year our own research institute where we do research into these materials, where we also do research into how packaging materials interact with food because we want to be a pacemaker on this. We don't just want to be a passenger. What's important, I know that uh, there's a lot of emphasis on recycling, but um, let's be realistic. Um, many parts of the world do not have existing recycling systems and will not have fully functioning recycling systems for long periods of time. And hence, in addition to recyclability, where we have a very strong commitment out by the year 2025, we are also doing research into issues such as biodegradability and compostability. 
So as we do this, we're not inadvertently supporting a throwaway society. We're simply trying to react to the reality around us. So when you take countries such as Indonesia or Mexico or others that have a vast surface area, a rugged terrain or any other challenges related to the geography, it is unlikely that in a short period of time you will see a successful recycling system there, and hence we're trying to cater to that reality. For most established economies, when you think about the United States, when you think about Western Europe, we do believe that a circular economy and recycling certainly is the best solution, and hence we're trying to contribute to that. But having a full suite of options and a range of options, I think, is certainly the best way since the world around us is pretty complex. And last but not least, but not least the diversity and inclusion. Um, like most companies, we're coming from a background where we're still quite a bit away from gender balance in our um, associate base and uh, leadership range. So we're certainly trying to make progress here. We have achieved 30% um, female participation in our management ranks as of last year, but that's certainly far away from where we want to be. And uh, so we're kicking off uh, next month a fairly ambitious three-year program to improve uh, female participation in our leadership ranks. In addition to that, um, we are also supporting much wider women's empowerment campaigns when you think about Africa and Latin America. So this whole notion of giving women in societies where equal opportunity is not a given, their own livelihood through entrepreneurial activities or job opportunities is something that's very near and dear to us. So when you think about, for example, micro-distribution in Africa, um, this is one of those areas where we've truly been doing pioneering work to help the case of women and help their financial independence. On the right-hand side, uh, youth employment opportunities, that's also a key area where we've been putting a lot of effort in as part of our global youth initiative. So this whole notion of giving youth access to uh, job opportunities and education and uh, sources of self-help is uh, very important to us. Here again, we're very much shaped by our experience and our background in agricultural communities, where in some cases, youth unemployment and uh, bleak economic prospects are rampant. And um, I believe that in most of these uh, countries that are particularly challenging, when you think about South America, Africa, um, I think we're making major progress and are recognized by governments around the world for our commitment uh, to this area. So this concludes the uh, creating shared value part of the presentation. And before finishing, let me show you some of the long-term shareholder results. As you can see here from the uh, um, left-hand side of the chart, whether it's a 10-year time horizon, a five-year, three- or one-year, compared to a relevant sample of stocks uh, companies, I think uh, our returns compare very favorably. And then when you look at the right-hand side, uh, you're seeing also a fairly regular commitment to returning uh, cash in a disciplined manner uh, to our shareholders, both in the form of dividends and also share buybacks that we have done uh, frequently over the past 10 years. So in total, since 2008, we've returned 118 billion Swiss francs to our shareholders. Obviously, these two tools uh, serve two different purposes. The dividend is clearly the best way to reward long-term shareholders who are on their journey with us. We're very committed to a steadily rising dividend. We've been increasing our dividend for the 24th consecutive year. And then share buybacks, of course, are a very good tool when it comes to making targeted changes to your balance sheet structure. So for example, two years ago when we announced our latest uh, share buyback program, what was driving that was a conscious decision to increase the level of uh, leverage in our balance sheet. And that sort of uh, change, of course, can best be done through a one-time share buyback program. Long-term success should never be in contrast to short-term intensity. So this is just a quick recap of our 2018 results. And as you see, um, everything is in a very pleasant manner, pointing from the lower left-hand corner to the upper right-hand corner. And this is the way it should be. <laughs> Let me say that um, long-term financial success uh, should not only be embodied and exemplified by the executive leadership team. I think it also has a lot to do with appropriate corporate governance. And uh, what I'm showing you here is the uh, skill grid of our board of directors. 
uh, including our latest two nominees. Uh, we've been now um, proposing nine new board members uh, to our uh, board of directors since 2015, so we're committed to a frequent uh, change and rejuvenation on the uh, board of directors. And you see here that um, on all different dimensions, from geography to, uh, to professional background, I think we're trying to have a broad set of uh, diverse backgrounds uh, in our board of directors. I think this diverse set of experiences and having a broad-based discussion is certainly one of the ingredients to success and avoiding that uh, you're, you're, you're suffering from a one-sided uh, management approach. And with that, let me try and pull it all together for you and uh, leave some additional time for questions and answer. So you've seen our uh, purpose that I outlined initially, uh, enhancing the quality of life and contributing to a healthier future. Uh, a purpose needs to resonate. It really needs to serve um, a, a specific job for society. But then what's more important than the purpose alone is also how you go about um, it as you pursue that purpose and we're very much about uh, doing this in a way that creates shared value so that everyone benefits and there is uh, a fairly equal sharing of some of the upsides that jointly get created. So that's something we strongly believe in. As you see, this is not a recent fad. This is something that really goes back right to the DNA and to the founding of the company and something we'll be committed to going forward. Appreciate your attention and look forward to your questions.